Witcher 2 is a pretty old game at the time of recording this review, and unfortunately it shows in a lot of places. However, is it still worth playing? Well, it might be if you already feel invested in Geralt's story and just want more of his adventures, because the story in this game is really good. However, if you're not really interested in the backstory and just want a nice open world game with lots of action and fighting in an RPG element, go play Witcher 3 instead because that does everything better. Personally, I've read some of the books and watched both Netflix TV seasons so far, enjoyed it all and just want more Witcher content in my life. So I came back to play Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings and I did enjoy it and I did appreciate it, but the game has some flaws which I'm going to tell you about in this review. By the way, if you'd like to see my entire playthrough and see the decisions and choices I made and my outcome to the game, there's a link in the description down below. So Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings sees everybody's favourite Witcher, Geralt of Rivia, get tangled up in the events around the murders of various kings of the Northern Realms. Geralt wouldn't normally give a shit about politics and all this faction and infighting, were it not for the fact that he's actually been implicated and framed for the assassination of one of them. And if he ever wants to safely set foot in the North again, he's going to have to clear his name. And that's going to be easier said than done when he's also trying to recover from his memory loss and trying to piece together the events that led him to this situation. With the help of his old friends, plus a few new ones that you might meet along the way, Geralt's going to have to negotiate the complex and treacherous politics of the different warring factions in the Witcher world, uncovering a few surprises and slaying a lot of monsters along the way. So basically, gameplay-wise, this translates into an action RPG. If you've seen or played Witcher 3, it is like that, but a scaled-down version in pretty much all regards. It's a large world, but it's not an open world. And as you're traveling through forests and cities, you find yourself going down lanes and corridors and can't really explore too much to the side of these. Lots of pretty frantic sword-based combat, where you also get to play with potions and bombs and some of Geralt's signs, which are like minor magic spells. Plus, of course, an extremely engaging main story, which does split into two different routes and you'll have to choose which one you take. Tons of side quests and lots of other meaningful decisions for you to make along the way, which will have a big impact on the end of the game. Okay, onto the graphics and sound and starting with the visuals. Let's be honest here. This game is now 10 years old or more, I think, and it looks it. The world generally looks pretty ugly. A lot of the non-important characters look pretty poorly done and just like ugly models as well. And there are some serious issues with lighting, especially in Flotsam, the first big area you'll come to and get to explore. Certainly compared to modern day games, this one doesn't look great. However, on the other side of this, the cutscenes are fine, I think, especially the main characters like Geralt. The animation looks okay. You can tell it's an older game, clearly, still. But if you put all the cutscenes together and watch them as a story, I don't think you'd be disappointed. It's fine. The camera angle can be a problem too, especially in the big boss fights. And there's not a great deal of settings you can tweak and play around with in this. Now, sound-wise, the voiceovers of the main characters are good. Some of the voices of the lesser characters or just general NPCs, maybe not so much. And I'm not talking so much about the voice acting, but perhaps the quality of the, the rendering or the recording. Certainly not up to today's standards. But overall, especially in the main cutscenes, you're not going to be too disappointed. It's pretty good stuff. And Geralt's voice is, of course, absolutely classic. That tower was ridiculous. It was designed to break the rebels' morale. A bunch of lords and lordlings took a ride to then pompously stride on top of the walls, while the real army fought and died below them in the shit and piss-filled streets. If years of service have taught me anything, it's that the Highborn don the best costumes and get the best vantage points, whether at a ball or in battle. But it's not the time for that kind of jousting, Witcher. Continue your story. There's also some awesome background music too as well, which really fits in with the Witcher theme and world. And combat sound effects are okay. Remember, we're dealing with an old game here. And also performance-wise, you won't be surprised to hear I didn't have any performance issues with this. If my machine can't run a 10-year-old game at pretty decent rates, <laughs> then there's something wrong. Okay then, on to my likes and dislikes. And as always, starting with the good stuff, my favourite thing about Witcher 2 was the story. 
It is epic. It is full of twists and turns and plot intrigues and lots of difficult decisions for you as the character to have to make. And there's a big point in the story about a third of the way through. You'll have to make an A or B choice over who you're going to follow. And that will set you up on a different path for the rest of the game, leading to a possible complete new playthrough another time to explore the other half of the game and all this fantastic story is prefaced by one of the most epic intros i think i've ever seen in a video game you see this awesome assassin come and take out one of the kings of the north and it just sets the scene who is this guy how has he got his powers and why is he bumping off the kings yes you've got it all in this typical witcher faction politics between the mages the scoyatels kings of the north the humans various little smaller factions getting involved and of course the evil empire Nilfgaard or are they the evil empire who is behind all this what have they got to gain and will you find out at the end of the game it's a good story and I really enjoyed it in fact if I'm honest it is the reason to play the game I also like the way that you level up and develop Geralt skills as you play through. There's three main branches to the skills. There's alchemy, where you fiddle around with the potions. There's the signs, where you can upgrade his magical abilities. And of course, there's the swordsmanship tree, which was my favourite. I really see Geralt as a fancy sword fighter, which I get from reading the books and watching the TV shows. And that's where I had the most fun. But of course, you can play the character exactly as you wish or you can play through multiple times tweak the skills differently each time you go and get something different out of it but tweaking the skills whichever path you go down is absolutely vital as Geralt starts off pretty weak at the start but put a few points into the swordsmanship tree and suddenly you feel like a, a master assassin yourself and speaking of feeling pretty weak at the start, the difficulty levels in this game make a very big difference. I played it through in the hardest one after having played Witcher 3 and being told the combat was similar to that, which it is. But it is difficult. It is tricky, especially at the beginning of the game before you get to spend any of your character points and level up. It's hard and it's unforgiving on the hardest level, but knock it down to the easiest level and you'll barely get scratched even in the boss fights it's quite a difference but there's a level there for everyone and for whatever level of challenge you want you will find it here and you can also change the difficulty on the fly as you go through the game so you can play through most of it on hard but if you get a really big bad frustrating boss fight which we'll talk about later you can chop it down to medium or easy just to get past it now i mentioned the important decisions throughout the story there are lots of them and it does have an impact on the end. It's not just on the end as well. It has an impact on various events leading all the way up to the end, which is really good. These aren't easy decisions either. Some of them you'll agonize over, not sure which is the right and which is the wrong. But in true Witcher style, there is rarely a right and wrong choice. It's just going to set you off down a different path. And sometimes you'll think about trying to choose the lesser of two evils because you know they both sound bad. But which one would you do? Which one would Geralt do? And which one should I take to try and get the outcome that I think I'm going to get? Also, about these decisions that you make, another thing that I liked about the game, but didn't take advantage of, is that your saves will carry over. So you can import a save from Witcher 1, which I haven't played, to be honest, but people tell me it's worth playing for the story. If you have played that, let me know what you think of it in the comments and whether you think I should give it a go. And your saves from Witcher 2 will carry over to Witcher 3. So all these various characters that you meet and help and kill or imprison or betray or whatever, well, it's important if you want to carry that story forward into Witcher 3 where you'll meet some of them again. Or some of the choices you make here can have an outcome in Witcher 3. And another great feature about The Witcher 2 is that you can pick it up for peanuts when it's on sale. Over on GOG.com where I got it from, it often goes for just a couple of quid and you'll get 20 to 30 hours of entertainment in one playthrough out of this. Yeah, I think that's a bargain. Now, I mentioned the game has a few flaws when I started this review, and there's a few things I didn't like about it. We'll start with the one that probably annoyed me the most, and that is the way the world is laid out. It's not the biggest world. It's not an open world like in Witcher 3, which is fine, but some areas are quite big, and it's hard to get around. It's just awkward for a start there's no fast travel so if you've wandered out into the forest or out into the quarry on whatever level you're on and you need to go back to town you've got to take the slow way back there's no mounts either so you're going to walk all the way back 
which is a bit of a pain when you know you're only going back to pick something up to then come back and do a quest in the same area. Also, when you're exploring outside of the towns, everything is off down a lane or a corridor with either cliff sides or invisible walls of trees built in that you can't move through. And you're guided down these roads to an objective or a monster or something to collect at the end of them. And then you'll weave your way back along the same corridor, not being able to deviate until you get back to the, like the central hub, the quest hub, if you like. It's not the most inventive use of the terrain in the world, and it's not very pleasant to get around. Also, some of you might see this as a positive. You can't just walk off ledges. So actually, it's, it's impossible to fall off a ledge anywhere in this game, which is one of the things with Witcher 3, Geralt would often fall to his death off a six-foot wall. But in Witcher 2, you can't. You walk up to the edge of it, and then you have to wait for the prompt and make sure you're stood in the right pixel place, and then you can press a button and you'll climb down it. So in fighting monsters or anything, you can't just roll off the edge, which is a benefit in that. But it also makes just walking down a hillside, which might zigzag down the side of the hill, very slow because you can't take shortcuts. You can't just nip over an edge. If you're fighting on a little platform, you can't just get off it. If there's a monster coming up, you have to go past the monster and down the steps. Now that is more of a problem. So all in all, that felt very awkward when you combine the lanes and corridors to get around and these ledges, which sometimes got you cornered in very bad situations also the boss fights i found were actually just too frustrating fighting general monsters and humans and stuff was fine and it was quite manageable and i played on the hardest level but i, I got a few shocks but it was okay but come to the boss fights and you'd often get one hit by something you just couldn't see coming because you're fighting some huge monster which half of it's off the top of the screen and your camera angle is stuck and you can't see the tentacle that's about to flay you you can't see what direction the attack is coming in and it feels like there's a lot of trial and error or trial die repeat repeat until you learn the exact pattern of everything and where you have to stand and do and fight and move and dodge and exactly when you have to do it until you can take these things down. I did find it very frustrating, not because it was just difficult or it's because it was random, but most of the time I couldn't see the thing that just killed me. And speaking of combat and fighting, there's no healing in combat in this. You can't quickly just down a potion and recover. All your potions have to be taken out of combat before it starts, which kind of relies on you knowing there's a combat encounter coming, which is fine if you can see the group of monsters or bad guys up ahead, and you can quickly down a potion of Swallow, which will give you a tiny bit of health regen during the fight. If you suddenly get ambushed or you walk into a load of monsters and you're in combat and you're not prepared, hey, tough shit. That's, <laughs> you're going to have to deal with it there and then because you can't take any of your potions once combat has started. Also, they don't last very long, so it's not like you can just have these things on and having a general effect as you walk around and explore, waiting for combat encounters to come, because you'll find yourself having to do it so many times. And that leads me into the next gripe I have with this. The inventory and character management screens are just hard work to get around. It opens up defaultly selecting your boots, but you're looking at the list of things you've got at the other side, and I've lost track of the amount of times that I sold my sodding boots thinking I was selling the sword that was listed at the top of the items in the backpack. And I only noticed half an hour later when I was running around barefoot in the forest trying to kill something. It's just not very well lit up. It's not obvious what page or what section you're in in the items. And yes, I did sell things that I didn't mean to and buy things I didn't mean to and mess things up several times during that. So overall, would I recommend Witcher 2 Assassins of Kings? Well. If you are really invested in the Witcher world and stories, if you've played Witcher 3 or Witcher 1 or read the books or watched the Netflix shows and you just want more, then yes, because the story is really, really good. If, however, you're the type of player who doesn't really get into stories and you don't care about what's going on and you want the action and the challenge and the combat, then don't play this. Go and get Witcher 3 instead because everything in that is done better. In fact, Witcher 2 makes you see how far they moved on and produced and what they did with Witcher 3. They basically addressed nearly every issue I had with Witcher 2 and then made a much better version of it in Witcher 3. Almost worth playing just for the perspective that it brings. But I would wait for a sale because you can get this for a couple of quid either on Steam or GOG where I got it from. There's a link down below in the description if you want to buy it from there, check it out. And for that price, you can't go far wrong. 
So I enjoyed it because I enjoyed the story and I want to play through it again to see the other side of the game and the different story options I didn't take. But boy, it really tried my patience in places.